Welcome to the latest episode of Flamingo's Apartment Rebels podcast. So I am really, really excited to have uh, Roland Mansili on our latest episode. So Roland is the co-founder and COO of uh, Safely Finance. Um, so Safely Finance is one of those companies in the multifamily space that is doing something that I think impacts almost like every renter. So if you have ever moved, um, you know how quickly the moving expenses can really like add up, whether it's the security deposit or even the application fee or pet fees or having to pay the first and the last months of rent. All of those things really add up very quickly. And for most people, uh, whether it's recent college grads or even people that are well into uh, their work lives, it's not always easy to be able to front um, such a large expense when you move. So Safely Finance is doing something really cool, which is the buy now and pay back model, but apply to uh, the multifamily and single family industry. So with Safely Finance, uh, they are able to basically provide micro loans to renters. So they are able, they can cover all of those upfront costs and then pay back um, a few or pay back uh, over time. So it really makes that moving process a lot less stressful uh, for potential renters and potential movers. Um, so Roland, welcome to the Apartment Rebels podcast. Thanks, Jude. I'm really excited to be here. Um, I love the show and I'm excited to have a casual chat about the industry. Okay, cool. So um, I would. Uh, so one thing to note is we actually went to the same college. <laughs> so we are both Dartmouth alumni and that's how we initially got connected and then found that we were in the same industry. Yep. Go big green. <laughs> yep. <laughs> um, so I uh, obviously know where you went to college, but um, how did you make your way into the multifamily industry? I know you're still, I wouldn't say like you have spent, you have a long career track, but you have touched on a lot of really cool companies and a lot of cool products from uh, Funding Circle to Lending Club and now to uh, starting your own company. So can you tell a little bit about your journey to where you are today? Yeah, absolutely. So it, it's funny because starting all the way back where we went to school together, I actually thought I was going to go into academics. I had this idea that maybe I might be a professor and I took a fellowship at Dartmouth upon graduation. Um, I found out that while the work was super interesting and engaging, it kind of uh, covered the intellectual curiosity that I have naturally. And I think you share um, it was just a little too slow paced. Uh, and I worked my way out to Silicon Valley and moved to California uh, to kind of understand what the fast paced you know, world of startups would be like as a complete opposite to that. Um, and I found myself uh, in a position uh, at Funding Circle, as you described, and that company was a rocket ship. You know, I joined uh, in 2013, saw the company go through a bunch of phases of growth and venture capital backing. Um, and eventually that company went public. Uh, I had moved on to Lending Club at the time where I was a product manager and basically seeing these FinTech products back to back, I got really excited about solving sort of complicated problems that people face day to day and there's no real solution for um, that they kind of can get to without going through some big institution, whether it's um, an, you know an enterprise level landlord or institutional landlord or a bank, um, you know some sort of like real societal institution. Uh, my co-founder and I were lucky enough that as we started noodling on ideas to, to narrow into, uh, combining our experiences as renters and folks who know fintech very deeply, uh, we applied to Y Combinator and eventually found ourselves building this product, uh, mostly around the interest uh, that we have in finding ways to make it easier for folks to go about their financial lives. And when your rent is your biggest expense for most people in America every single month, uh, it overlapped really nicely for us to tackle it. Um, and that's how we got into the space as opposed to someone who maybe has been in, in property or real estate for a long time. Cool. So um, looking at how you guys kind of uh, got started, like how did you and your co-founder actually meet? And then how did all of this like kind of consolidate to um, safely finance? It's always, it's always fun to talk about this. Uh, I like that question. Jason and I have worked very closely together uh, for many years, 
we actually met at Lending Club where Jason was an engineering manager and I was a product manager and we were actually building um, real solutions, uh, mobile apps, uh, web apps, uh, and fintech apps for, for customers on a massive scale. We both left the company um, you know, around the same time. We're, we were close personal friends. Uh, we lived near one another and we were going on walks, uh, meeting up at cafes as we were talking about what we wanted to figure out what to do next. Jason had just started a family. He was taking a little time away from work. Um, I was deciding whether or not I wanted to travel or maybe take some time away. Uh, and we just couldn't put down that sort of uh, feeling that we wanted to keep working together. And so we started hacking on a variety of apps just at coffee shops, kind of like a real Silicon Valley story. I think we were probably the most loyal customers to the Joe and the Juice coffee shop in Palo Alto in 2018, 2019. Um, so yeah, I think that, that you know that's how we met, and it was just kind of a, a match, at the right place, right time. We're friends. Hmm. So then, in terms of like safely finance, like what exactly do you all like do, and why is this such a big problem for uh, people moving? Yeah. So we, as you know, and it, like we talked about, right? It's uh, I'm very excited about our mission, right? We we deliver flexible payments and financing for renters. Um, and this is a big problem because it's the key part of finalizing any move you make when you're a renter, right? You're so excited. You toured the perfect apartment or home. You uh, reviewed the lease. You crossed all the T's, dotted all the I's. And now you have to break out your wallet, right? <laughs> uh, it can be stressful. It can make some folks sweat. Um, it's definitely a situation where even if you are uh, you know, better off or, or maybe more fortunate than some folks, you still have to make maybe some transfers across accounts, make sure everything's in order. So we think this is a really interesting problem because it touches every single renter. It's not just one type of property or one type of product or one type of customer. Um, and we're on a mission to make it easier for everyone, whether that's finding more modernized payments with some of our partners in real estate where we're offering them digital wallets where folks can pay through things like, for example, Google Pay uh, or where it comes to actually making those payments more affordable and easier to manage. There's a large portion of our customers whose average bank balance is under $1,000 uh, every single month. And for them, it's not that they are folks who are destitute, to, you know, to be very clear. It's that they're folks that just earn a consistently smaller amount of income than maybe some of their peers. They might be folks who are teachers or public servants or something like this. Maybe they're nurses just starting a career. And for them, they have very consistent income. They're good credits. They just need to have those payments broken up into time because they want to move into a nice apartment. But as you mentioned, when it comes to paying your first month of rent, your last month of rent, a deposit, uh, a fee for bringing a dog with you or a cat to the apartment, uh, it's a lot to handle at once. Uh, and they can afford it, but just in chunks over time. So we're really excited about the mission of making both of those experience payments and financing much simpler for everyone. Yeah. So a lot of people are familiar with like the buy now and payback model. So it works really well for the consumer space. So I want this like TV or I want this really nice dress. So for a lot of people, I don't think they've heard how it works specifically in this type of space. So for something that's actually really necessary, not that buying a TV isn't necessary, but a place to live is like so critical. So right. is this something that's like new or is this something that um, has kind of been around? You know, I think in its full con like concept, this is new to the industry. There are a handful of companies that have married fintech and prop tech together in a very successful way, but they've mostly focused on deposit replacements. And by that, I mean, finding uh, sort of interesting ways of doing insurance or some sort of sort of financial hack to get around the payment at the beginning. We chose not to pursue that model because it creates uh, an annuity stream, you know, basically just a stream of payments renters have to make that they never see back. We wanted to create a system that not only solved the problems of security deposits affordability, but still provided the security for the, for the property in some sort of collateral that was going to be returned back to the renter at the end of the day. Um, how often have we as consumers in our daily lives looked forward to things like you know, getting your tax return back and having a little extra cash or getting that bonus from your paycheck. It's the same with the security deposit for a lot of folks. Um, if they have an affordable way of, of getting around this problem where they're paying it in a way that makes sense, that isn't a lump sum of cash, it's nice to get that money back as opposed to just paying hundreds of dollars throughout a lease that disappear because they're held by some insurance business. So um, in this way, I think it's new for the industry. 
And then, you know, if, if you want to chat through it, um, I think there's also ways that we're more innovative or differently suited in a better way for this industry as opposed to traditional BNPL when you think of large consumer e-commerce brands like Affirm or Klarna, you know? Interesting. And then in terms of like how the mechanism actually works, so I think how you all operate is actually provide like micro loans to the renters and then they themselves like pay the mover or pay their apartment manager or something else. Is that how it works? Yeah. So we, that's, that's very, that's very close to where we started and we've evolved since then and it's been super exciting. So from the get go, we believe that it was important for us to develop a relationship with the customers we're serving to understand exactly what their problems and needs are and their wants. So we have a direct to consumer offering where on our website, a customer can sign up, they can create an account. They can tell us a bit about where they're moving to and when they're moving as well as what they would like to purchase for their move, be it furniture, uh, moving services for relocation, um, help moving out and cleaning up the apartment or home that they might be renting today, so on and so forth. Um, and we find ways to either fund them directly with, with a loan to pay those costs or to pay the vendor directly so that they only have to go through one portal. They don't have to make a bunch of different payments. They don't have to write checks to some people, swipe cards for others and pay online for, for third groups. They can do it all in one place. So this is the way it works and the way we believe will make this much easier for everyone. Over time, our goal is to build a location for the customer to be able to pay for all of their move in one portal. Oh, wow. So what would that actually look like from uh, like the renter perspective? I think from the renter perspective, it just looks like ease, right? Today, whenever anybody says even the word moving, we all kind of get this feeling in the back of our mind of like, oh man, I don't even want to think about that. Mm -hmm. So I think from here, it looks like either uh, a very low friction experience, you know, everything's mobile first these days, right? So something that plugs in natively with either mobile apps, property management apps, um, apps like uh, that serve these communities, which you know very well, right? And the payment experience can just be sort of a magical piece they don't even think about, um, where API is integrated direct, where you know safely is integrated directly via API um, or widget into these tools. I think um, to the loan piece that you talked on, I'd be remiss not to mention we, um, you know, we have grown beyond micro loans. We actually do larger loan sizes than traditional BNPL. Uh, particularly because of so, you know, how heavy the burden is for these customers. Mm -hmm. With a lot of these folks moving to urban areas where the best and highest paying jobs are, which aren't all of our customers, but are, are a good portion of them, they might be paying to move to Los Angeles, to Chicago, to New York, to Miami, San Francisco, uh, up to $10,000 or more. Wow. So uh, our limit's actually a multiple of that, much larger than that. And uh, we do it in a way where we're not offering or not taking any sort of fees. So we're extremely customer friendly. Then what is like the size of the typical loan or the, the size of like the, what the size of the typical loan and the size of like the typical move? Right. So the typical move within a state, uh, you know, can cost from a couple hundred dollars to a couple thousand dollars. When you're looking at an average for trans state moves nationwide in the U.S., it can cost over four thousand dollars. On our platform, we see customers coming through every single day applying for a range between those numbers, if not more, because they're also buying furniture, appliances, paying for services like movers. Uh, so our, our typical loan application comes in, you know, somewhere around five or $6,000 or more. Um, although it changes with time, you know, depending on seasonality and types of movers. I'm sure you know this super well, but at different points in the year, you have students moving, families moving, so on and so forth. And then uh, what's like the typical payback period? Um, so once someone like takes out that loan, like what is that payback period? Yeah, that's that's super important, right? Because it determines how much they can spread out the cost of their move. We offer a standard option of six or 12 months and every customer today gets this option. So the choice is in their hands to make trade-offs around the risk that we're going to take as the lender on paying us back over a longer, shorter period of time. And the trade-off there will typically be a slightly different interest rate uh, you know, and the monthly payment will vary as a result. So we like to give customers basically a choice. Would you like to pay less every single month uh, and spread it out over a longer period of time? Or do you just need this broken up to, you know, a slightly smaller amount than the lump sum up front and you just want to pay it off more quickly? And today that means six or 12 month plans. Wow. So you've kind of touched on this like a few times, but we'd love to really like understand the customer journey from start to end. 
So how does someone find Safely Finance? Like how do you all acquire customers? How do they know you exist? And then what does that process look like from them learning about you to then deciding, oh, this is this is something I need for my move and then actually uh, completing your orientation process and then uh, getting the loan and then paying you back? Great, great question. I love thinking about our customer journey because it's so important to creating empathy in our product. For our customers, a lot of them find out about us in one of two ways. They either learn about us online where they learn about us via social channels or search. Uh, on the other side of the equation, we have a lot of customers that learn about us through partnerships that we do with properties. And this can be with their property manager or with an independent property as well, um, where it's owner operated. For these customers, either way, they get put into an experience where once they've learned about us, they learn a little bit more by coming to our website or by using the tools that we provide their property manager on maybe a site that they maintain under their own brand. Here, they get a sense for what it's gonna be like, what they might need to prepare to actually submit a quick application for credit. And they understand things like, we're not gonna do uh, a hard credit pull. So it's not gonna impact their credit score. They learn about things like the fact that we'll just ask for a simple connection uh, to learn a little bit more about their bank account. This helps us in a way where we're ensuring that they have serious intent to move. And it also helps protect the properties because we can prevent bad actors, folks who are just uh, spinning up bank accounts to create fraudulent transactions. Unfortunately, it's something that happens a lot in the payments industry. So that second step of the customer experience is very light for the customer, but serves a very important you know, purpose for, for our partners. When you think about the next step in the customer life cycle, it's just getting through that application, which happens pretty quickly. Most of our customers spend less than two minutes on it. As I mentioned, they share a little bit of information about their move with us. And we make an instant decision in most cases about whether or not they'll be approved for financing. That said, we didn't want to be a company where we were only offering a solution to some people. And this is where the payments piece comes in. Everyone will always get an opportunity to use Safely Finance if they'd like to. It just is whether they use a payment tool that is easier for them. And in here, we offer things like cards versus ACH, so on and so forth, or whether they qualify for our financing. And you know, to be direct, if, if you're someone who uh, can afford a lease in an apartment building, you're probably someone who can afford our financing. So you get that offer at that point. Make your choice, as I mentioned, about uh, whether you'd want to pay over a longer or shorter period of time. And then from there, it's just as simple as getting the loan funded and being about your way. We don't want this to be a long customer journey or a complicated one. As I mentioned, we want it to be magical. That's really awesome. And then I'm curious for your customer base. Like, do you see, um, like, is it specific groups, things in the apartment industry, for example, you have quite like a wide range of apartments from class A to class B to class C. So are you seeing like a specific sub-segment, whether it's socioeconomic, that really gravitates to a safely finance, or is it kind of all over the place? I know you mentioned like a lot of, uh, some of your customer profiles is that young nurse that mm -hmm. just graduated is making like a really steady salary, but maybe isn't able to really afford like a wide, um, pretty like large, like upfront cost. So is it kind of like that sweet spot or do you see everything across the board? You know, we see everything across the board, but it is interesting to note that we do have certain concentrations, like you mentioned, and, and our customer personas, like we were talking about, certainly reflect that. I think uh, a nice thing about being in our industry from a, from a company perspective is everybody has to make a payment, right? And, and a lot of folks uh, understand that, you know, if you get an affordable rate or even we go down to the, as low as 0%, breaking up your payment just makes financial sense. Mm -hmm. So with that in mind, we do see customers of, of all walks of life. Those that need it most, though, and, and our biggest customer segment tends to skew to folks who are younger and earlier in their career, folks who maybe have a little bit less credit history, um, who maybe have uh, less experience even uh, with renting. Those customers tend to really enjoy working with us because we offer uh, something that's easy for a tech company to do, but might not be so easy for a real estate business, which is we can move very quickly. We can deliver a very modern experience that has the latest touches and user experience, as well as uh, sort of expectations for how someone works about, you know, sending any sort of online service. Um, and that's like I mentioned before, being mobile first, being flexible, offering an API product that can embed. Um, it generates these experiences 
on the customer side that are incredibly flexible. So, you know, for our customers, we do things like customer service over SMS or texting, right? Our customers really like that. And that's the way that, you know, most people today under a certain age tend to communicate. It's natural for them. They don't want to have to call in. So it's touches like that that we're really focused on to reflect uh, the best service we can for this for this customer group. Particularly folks, I think if we want to talk in more like marketing terms, you know, I think 60% of Gen Z prefers mobile payments to any other form of payment, specifically things like Apple Pay, Google Pay, and PayPal. Um, you know, and that market size is pretty large. There's 30 million folks, I think, uh, between the ages of 18 and 24 who are entering the renting market um, over the next couple of years. So it's a pretty large opportunity. No, oh, that's really cool. And then something you mentioned uh, just now that you mentioned earlier is some of like the integrations that you all have, whether it's like Apple Pay or other things. Can you kind of touch a little bit more on that and how that all like works and why it's actually needed? Because I'm curious, like why for like a renter or, or someone moving, like where that comes into um, play? Yep, absolutely. So, you know, it's not that these options don't exist in other platforms. For us, it's about making it as easy as possible and including as many as possible. You know, the most options in the most affordable packages, is, I think, what we aim or strive for. So for us to offer a property, uh, the chance to offer their renters or for us in our direct to, to renter product to offer these um, is really quite simple to, to run the gambit. You know, Apple Pay, Google Pay, PayPal, Samsung Pay, ACH, um, other forms of, of advanced online uh, you know, payments. Um, and anything that comes up that's new, it's easy for us to do because we're coming from the world of prop tech. We're coming yeah. from the world of fintech and our company top down is tech savvy. You know, uh, even as the COO of the business, I know how to program, right? Um, I come from a product management background. Uh, my co-founder has spent, Jason, our CEO, years and years building software for incredible companies like Apple, Lightning Club, et cetera. So for us to add these integrations is simple. And then the need for that, you know, as I mentioned, you might have one platform and another that offers a certain type of payment or it might not. I mean, even recently, I can remember renting apartments here in California where there was some sort of proprietary payment system. I logged on to some sort of portal that I couldn't tell whether or not it was actually secure. I felt mm -hmm. very scared about putting my credit card details or debit card details or bank direct debit details into this sort of space. So wrapping it in a package that feels secure, that has clear messaging, that really resonates with the customer, I think is the big differentiator for us, as well as having the options, you know, just giving them a drop down menu at payment uh, or the point of payment for this customer to pick what they want, whether it's BNPL, whether it's a car, mm -hmm. whether it's anything else, right? That's really cool. And then so on the partner side, so I know part of your distribution channel is really working with uh, the apartment managers. So what kind of impact are you seeing and how do those apartment managers like get your product in front of like potential renters? And I'm curious uh, how this impacts um, the things that they care about, whether it's conversion rates for uh, prospects or maybe on-time payments for rent or other things. Like, have you seen any of that impact and how do you all like track that? So that's something that we're definitely uh, growing into, right? We're a young company, we're a startup, we're backed by some incredible investors, um, including folks like Y Combinator. And mm -hmm. they really believe in, in the roadmap and vision we've drawn out for them, which is uh, including technology uh, sort of components like, like portals for tracking uh, sort of rent trends and, and renter lifecycle, like you mentioned. It's also incredibly useful data for other partners in the space. I mean, if you think about folks like even, uh, on the retail side of things like Home Depot, right? As more and more Americans rent, Home Depot needs to change the way that they sell their products to reflect uh, the needs of renters as opposed to homeowners, right? So, so having a data product like that is gonna be very interesting for us in the future. Um, you know, I think today where we are with the roadmap and what we're doing with the product, um, it's, it's a little more focused on features that are really gonna make that renter experience and moving, you know, super simple and clean. So I think, I think, you know, that's kind of the second part of your question. I guess, is there a particular sort of component in the first part of the question that um, the question that kind of stands out most to you, you think is most interesting? I'd love to kind of dig into that a bit. Yeah, so for me, it's really around, if I think about this from like a distribution perspective, it's sometimes difficult for renters to know this type of product like exists. So part of how you get some additional distribution is partnering with a property management company or like an apartment owner. 
and then that gets you a little bit more distribution and it's in front of them but the Absolutely. typical challenge is the uh, prospects or the current residents still don't know it exists right yeah no that's that's a classic uh classic problem in the industry right in this i need to give a huge shout out to our partners at a property in boulder colorado called rev um, <laughs> and the uh the the community manager there uh, a woman named danielle has been tremendous in giving us feedback as we've thought through this problem right so we we signed a partnership with them where we're working with them as a property manager they wanted to offer this product to their customers moving in as they're leasing up and stabilizing this new property uh, and we, as a, as a company, wanted to find a way to get this into the hand of their customers. So we developed ways to do um, not overwhelming, but very engaging touch points. Things mm -hmm. like drip email campaigns, things like um, shout outs on amenity pages that the mm -hmm. property manager maintains for the property. You know, little things that are going to stand out to the customer in the same way as when I'm you know, evaluating a rental, I might think, oh, this property has a gym. That's great. Mm -hmm. uh, this property has uh, on-site laundry. That's fantastic. There's a garage. Oh, this property has safely financed. I wonder what that is. Let me learn a little bit more about what that amenity is. And treating it as a financial amenity means that there's this natural curiosity yeah. from a perspective. And that's been a big way for them to find out about us. Yeah, no, that's really awesome. And it's it's always really helpful to have those like partners that are really bought into it. So Absolutely. have you seen like any differences between some of your partners that really get it? Like the Daniel, you just give a shout out to versus some that maybe don't get it as well. And what do you think the difference is? Right, yeah. So I think, you know, there's ups and downs, right? I think there's, uh, even for the best partners, it depends on the seasonality and them knowing their business um, for their specific market and their types of customers. You know, is it a college town? Is it uh, a part of a major city where there's young professionals? Is it uh, a suburb or exurb where the rental market is maybe established professionals with families? And understanding what the best channel is for getting the message in front of each of those folks. You know, as I mentioned, we do some some work with texting and SMS that might reach one audience uh, one way, but, but totally miss another audience. Um, so getting that feedback with some folks and designing the right program is key. And I think this is where you know an ask I would have for potential partners in the industry or folks who are looking um, from the seat of an innovation role or maybe a head of technology in a, in a property company or a real estate company is to really ask yourself, I want, you know, if I want solutions that are going to make my business run better and that are going to give my renters a better tenant experience here, what do I need to do to actually make the integration successful? Because it's not like you just, as we both know, sign up and then all of a sudden, you know, it's like magic. This is just working, right? That you would hope that a product does that, you know, to the best ability it can. But there's also, like you mentioned, the need to really get it in front of the customers in the right way. And really who knows those tenants best is the folks yeah. who run the community, right? Okay. And then, so if someone like talks to like a Daniel, like what kind of value do you think she sees most for this? Uh, because like in the apartment industry, one of the classic things is like, show me the RI or like, what is the benefit here? So for um, an owner, a manager, like what are the things that they like rave about? I think for us, it's knowing that the customers feel like they're in control and, uh, you know, when they're touring a building, it gives them a greater sense of confidence that this is a property that could feel like home and closing out that funnel, and that conversion rate, right? Making sure that you're making the most use and best use out of the time and energy that your leasing agents uh, mm -hmm. put into the process. I think that's really the focus, right? Um, and then um, the other things I'm, I'm really curious about, because for something like this, I'm sure you guys see a lot of data across the board. And that's obviously just going to keep growing as the company like continues to grow, as you get like more renters like on board. Uh, but what are some of the key things you track from the business, from your business perspective? And then what are some of the things that you show off to your customers or to other people that are like, hey, show me some data about like why safely finance actually impacts my operations or my business? It's a great question. You know, it's funny, we're, we're very stringent about this internally, um, sure. you know, from a data perspective. And we actually, when we're working with real estate partners, um, we build, this might sound a little, uh, maybe a little excessive for some, for some folks in prop tech, but we actually build a rigorous real estate investment financial model for each property that we're going to partner with. And we think through specifically from the perspective of an owner, 
-hmm. how is this going to make more uh, efficiency or more uh, net operating income or value for my property? And it's funny across all the different properties that we've done this for. And as I mentioned, it's, it's all the partners we work with, whether they're in, um, you know, workforce housing, low income housing, market rate housing. We found that the sort of typical range that we estimate where stable finance will make an impact um, hovers around, you know, the 15 to 25 percent mark in terms of increase over the lifetime of the asset in terms of NOI, yeah. um, which is, yes, yeah, if it could be hundreds of thousands of dollars or millions. And the cool thing about this is just recently, I wish I'd, I'd saved myself the energy. I was reading a report from RBC Capital Markets that talked about buy now, pay later um, options, increasing conversion rates and uh, profitability of vendors by 20 to 30 percent. So, you know, it, it's funny, it's just the coincidence, uh, the correlation is super strong, which gives us even more confidence that our yeah. product's going to continue to work this way. Wow, that's amazing. Uh, and then. Um, so what are some of the things that are next on your roadmap? I know you mentioned a couple of things, whether it's increasing like the size of the loans or just like additional integrations, but what are some of the key things that uh, you all have planned? So we've, we've increased the size of the loans already and that's been running fantastically. Uh, I think in line with that, something we want to do next is develop uh, or continue to develop something that's been on the roadmap. We, we built our app and, and software in a way where we can actually have flexible terms. So we'd like to um, offer everyone and not just select partners, the ability to actually have their customers choose beyond six and 12 months. Mm -hmm. uh, that I think is gonna be a great way to increase this feeling of control in the checkout process for the tenant. I think we also wanna look into ways where maybe we um, offer more payment options, mm -hmm. uh, you know, in, in a very easy, lightweight uh, way. So as I mentioned, directly paying for something one portal is something we, we hear a lot when we do customer interviews. If you're someone who's moving from Chicago to San Francisco, you're gonna maybe need a plane ticket or you know renting some sort of moving truck, right? Being able to pay for that directly out of the same, um, same application or same user experience is, is the next piece as opposed to just funding the loans directly to the customers or the properties, you know? Wow. And then, so what is kind of like the timeline or roadmap for that look like? You know, we're working as hard as we can, right? I think we want to we want to get it out as soon as possible. Uh, the technology is there. I think we're we're waiting for the right partner to come along yeah. um, that kind of sees the vision with us, where we can build it for a larger portfolio. I think that's really mm -hmm. that will get us to to prioritize that higher in the roadmap. Yeah. And then, um, what do you think are some of the key things that um, property like operators or the real estate people like get wrong about products like these? Especially when it comes to like how it impacts either conversions, resident experience, or just like overall like NOI. Like what are some of the key things that you run into when you are positioning this to uh, decision makers? I think this is this is a really key question because it benefits uh, our customers in a big way, also us. But it, I think they, they tend to think about it in what they know or what they've experienced. And I think when you think about fintech or payments from like five or 10 years ago, and easier ways to pay at point of sale or point of checkout. A lot of folks think of like going to some sort of retail store and getting a branded credit card offered to them as they check out. I mean, how often have we been in a line somewhere in front of a cash register and the person is asked, hey, do you wanna apply for our credit card, right? Um, and applying that same sort of mindset when you think of for that same market in retail, a company like a firm is just a very, um, not apples to apples comparison, right? Um, I think at one point, uh, you know, a firm doing business with, for example, Peloton as their largest customer was making multiples of tens of millions of dollars incrementally for them every quarter, which is, which is not just, you know, offering a credit card. It, it's really something that's actually a conversion product, uh, you know, revenue product, driving product, the way that the way that you were talking about it. So I think that's the first thing they get wrong is they, they compare it to payment systems of the past as opposed to thinking of it as its own unique product. Mm -hmm. I think the second thing they don't understand is that there's ancillary benefits. So Tenants can boost their credit score uh, if they're paying on time with a product like this. Uh, I think, I don't know if the stat is totally up to date, but I think like less than 1% of renters in the US get their on-time rent payments reported to credit bureaus. Mm -hmm. So that's a massive opportunity that's just totally fine under the radar today and should be more apparent because it'll build loyalty for them. You know, yeah. how great would it be as a young, you know, professional moving to a city, not a lot of credit history, if I associate my landlord with someone who helped me boost my credit score by 20, 30, 40 points. You know, so I think that's the second piece. 
the last piece I, what, I think what's surprising about that is like for me even like being in the industry i didn't realize mm. that that could be a thing until literally this year well, actually no just last year and yeah. it's crazy because red really is the largest expense that most people have what and what a signal of, of credit of creditability right like yeah. you're paying thousands of dollars on time every month i mean you should get a massive you know plus 100 you know gold star for like for, for making that payment not just because you paid off a ten dollar credit card bill or something right yeah 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 no absolutely yeah so that those are the things i think right maybe maybe there's a third one right too which is like that they compare a lot of the early fintech prop tech companies to, to folks that are trying to move beyond that so deposit replacement's a big one too right mm -hmm. a lot of folks we speak with only think in terms of deposit replacement and they can't really see the forest for the trees on where innovation is moving mm -hmm. so i would encourage innovation teams to really think uh you know beyond the products that they've seen and they know and really what the future looks like mm -hmm. nice and then so how have you been able to overcome that oh looking at your, your data what are some of those like key like customer success stories that have come out uh, that you can really position and put in front of a decision maker and they're like oh my god i get it so for us i think i like to turn to uh customers that we've actually worked with for that you know i think about uh i think about the customers that we've, we've been serving and in that regard i think there's uh you know examples we like to show for typical customers uh and the use cases because again when folks think about this product is just deposit replacement or, or some sort of like you know when they when they look at like insurance or waiver options to replace deposits they forget like you mentioned the use cases of relocation furnishing etc so we have you know real customers that have come through and we can see the data you know we had a customer apply for like a four thousand five hundred and eighty one dollar loan recently and it's such a specific number and when when you call the customer to kind of learn what they were what they were looking for in research after the fact we're like oh that's the exact cost of two couches from this specific furniture company wow yeah. i love that <laughs> <laughs> which is great because then we can call the furniture company and say hey are you interested in finding easier ways to sell your product to these renters who want it right so it looks like like the partner ecosystem is something that's really key for you all then. Exactly. Yeah, I couldn't have said it better. Yeah. No, that's really cool. And um, my last question for you is like, as you think about like the future and like next steps, um, where do you think the apartment industry is going? Whether it's um, specific to fintech or specific to prop tech or just like a change in expectations what are some of the things that you see or you predict happening over the next like two to three years so this this might be a little bit of a hot take given the popularity of of, of single family rentals right now and uh folks looking for you know standalone housing but i think the opinion that I hold very strongly is that there's going to be uh, more of a, of a revolution or evolution in terms of density. You know, we already see this even in standalone units with uh, the proliferation of tiny homes. Mm -hmm. But I think that's going to translate to not just I have, you know, a container home or a small square footage home on a, on a standalone piece of property to I have uh, a very, you know, well constructed, um, high quality um, and comfortable, but very small apartment um, in, a, in an urban area. I think high density, small unit um, apartments are gonna be a, a big thing. Uh, and the same way that folks think about traditionally, uh, you know, throughout the 20th century, like starter homes, this idea of starter apartments. You know, if you don't have roommates or if you only have one roommate, um, if you're not eating a lot of meals where you're cooking in your apartment, but you're out and about as a young professional, right? You might not need a full kitchen. You might not need this, that, or the next thing. And you can, you can cut out some of the square footage. And while this sounds, you know, maybe not like something every renter wants. I think it's super important because the density means we can build more housing, which is mm -hmm. something that we can all agree we need. Wow, uh, I know a lot of that. I uh, know would we'll be really curious to see that uh, come to be. I know a few places like um, WeWork, they had looked at like the We Live concept where it was really like micro and very, very small apartments where it was like, hey, you need a place to sleep. You need a place to watch TV. You don't really need a kitchen or anything else. Right. Yeah. yeah, totally. You know, yeah. I think yeah, that I would have loved to have had that earlier in my life. And even now, you know, um, I, I try to live small as, as best as I can, small and yeah. back, you know. And, and, we did it. We did it in college. There's no reason <laughs> not to. <laughs> exactly. 
<laughs> right, a hundred percent. If if you can live in a in a dorm room where you have three people in bunk beds, it's not that bad to live in your yeah. own apartment. Yeah. The square footage isn't that large. <laughs> oh, nice. Well, Roland, it was really awesome to have you on the podcast and learn more about um, how um, you guys are really changing the game for renters at one of the times where it's the most stressful. <laughs> And I think I'm really excited to see how you all like continue to grow and how the product uh, really continues to evolve. Um, so thank you so much for being on. Yeah, thanks so much for having me. This was really fun and looking forward to continuing the conversation and good luck with everything uh, on your side as well. I know you have travel coming up, so yeah. Well, uh, thank you. Uh, that is it for our latest episode of the Apartment Rebels podcast. Uh, thank you, everyone. <laughs>